Have you ever felt overwhelmed with everything that you have to do in your life? Has that ever happened to you? Do you remember, I'm looking around our room, and I know we have different ages and stages of life in here, but do you ever remember feeling when you were younger, you think, well, now I'm in college or my career is just starting and things will be easier when I, when I get done with this stage of my life, when my apprenticeship is over, when this part, that'll be easier. And then I remember thinking when I was in college, it'll be so much easier when I get out of college and I don't have a roommate anymore and I don't have all the schoolwork and I just have a job to focus on. And then you get to that stage of life and find out that it's busier than you ever imagined. And then if God brought a spouse into your life and then children, and it seems like at every stage, we imagine that somehow it's going to be easier, but it's only busier. And I've heard some people that have retired tell me, I need to go back to work so I can get a break. I don't entirely understand that yet, but some of these folks have found themselves with wonderful opportunities, but also demanding schedules in that season of life. And I found out a few things that we're always going to be pulled in many directions. And if you're ever going to serve the Lord, you're going to serve the Lord when you're busy. But many Christians are being pulled in many directions. And because of that, they're finding themselves living a life far below what it is that Christ has saved them for. We're pulled in so many different directions. We have obligations to families and to our jobs and to school for those that are, that are in that stage. And just to society. We endure criticism all the time for what we are doing or not doing in our life and putting online with it. There's endless videos and books and podcasts telling us what we ought to be doing and all sorts of advertising telling us what we, if we're not buying or don't have, then we're not going to be happy. And all of these things pull us in so many directions and we make a millimeter of progress in a million directions and end up living a life that is far below what Christ wants for us. So what are we supposed to do with our lives? And how can we make the most of this one life that we've been given? Tonight, we're rejoining Paul in our study in the book of Acts as he is in the hot seat before a council of powerful people. Most of them are ready to kill him. And with one simple statement at the very beginning, we have our hearts and minds reoriented to what truly matters. And so let's begin together in Acts chapter 23 tonight as we read the word of God. The Bible says, and Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest, Ananias, commanded them that stood by to smite him on the mouth. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? Then said Paul, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called into question." And when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel hath spoken to him, let us not fight against God. And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray that you would add your blessing to the reading of it by giving us understanding, by your spirit showing us and guiding us into truth tonight. I pray that as you have promised, you would be here with us, helping us. I pray that you'd show us exactly what we need. We'd show us ourselves and yourself and make us more like your son. In Jesus' name, amen. The Apostle Paul is a missionary church planter. He's itinerant. He's traveling from city to city on different journeys, some of them lasting years. And each new city he would go to, he would preach the gospel. He'd see people believe the good news of Jesus, that gospel being the message of the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And then people would come to believe that. They'd be baptized, organized into churches, and then he would continue on. And after doing this three times, he finally comes back 
into the land of Jerusalem, into this area of Judea, and he comes to Jerusalem, and it just turns into a madhouse. It is the Feast of Pentecost. The city is filled to bursting with visitors. People recognize him as a once persecutor of Christians, now a powerful preacher, preaching Jesus as the Messiah. And he ends up getting attacked by a mob because they're upset with him over things he didn't even do. The Roman guards that have the charge of the city of Jerusalem have to step in, break up the fight, take Paul, and try and get him safe. Paul has a brief moment to defend himself to the mob, and when he tells them about what it is that has happened in his life, they were with him, and they were believing him, that he saw the risen Christ, and all of it up to the point where he said that God would send him to the Gentiles, which this Jewish mob could not endure, and so he's taken back up into the castle, into the fortress with the Romans, and he is given another chance to speak. The Roman captain, realizing that he's a Roman citizen, that Paul's a Roman citizen, he can't deal with him until he's gone through due process. And so he takes him down to the ruling council of the Jewish religious elite, the Sanhedrin, so that Paul could testify before them and so the captain could know what is this crime that has been leveraged against Paul that he was so treated by the mob. And that brings us to Acts chapter 23 and verse 1. It says, And Paul earnestly beholding the council. This council, as I mentioned the name of it, is called the Sanhedrin. It is the ruling religious body of the Jewish people. It's made up, historically, of 71 different people. And it was divided, as we'll find out here, between two major groups. And it was this ruling religious body. It was the highest law of the land that you could appeal to. It was the highest rulership that we should say that the Romans allowed the Jewish people to have. And he gets an audience with them. He tried to speak to the crowds, and he only got so far, and then he got shouted down. And now he thinks, I have this opportunity. And so earnestly, with intensity, with boldness, he speaks before this council. And instead of coming to them as some sort of supplicant, he speaks to them as an equal, knowing what it is that God had done in his life. And he says, men and brethren, and he makes this declaration, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. That is quite a statement. That is quite a statement. We know that Paul is not saying that he's perfect. He describes himself as the chief among sinners in some of his other writings that God led him to write. So we know that he is not making some declaration that he's never done anything wrong. But what he's saying is that as he begins speaking, he was saying, I have tried to please God with my life. Until this day, this is what my life has been about. It's been trying to please the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He thought this would be a good opening. He thought this would be a good way for them to understand where it is he's coming from. He's not starting something new with preaching Jesus. Jesus is the Messiah that was always promised. And as he speaks this, it goes off the rails almost immediately. Have you ever been in a room that you felt was kind of hostile to you? You ever walk into a meeting you ever walk into your home and feel like, uh-oh, something is wrong. They're not going to give me the open hearing that I was hoping for. Something is very off here. Paul doesn't get this phrase out of his mouth before things turn sour. Verse number two, and the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. The high priest is a position that changed relatively frequently among the children of Israel. It was a high position, a leadership position, and a man named Ananias, which is different than the Ananias that we know of, that Paul met on his time when he was in Damascus. This is not the same person. This is somebody that the Jewish historians describe as really an awful person. He is violent, and he is conniving, and he is greedy. And he uses violence and threats and even assassination of his enemies. He's an awful guy, this Ananias, if Josephus, the Jewish historian, is to be believed. And we sort of get that feeling because Paul doesn't get a word out of his mouth before they're saying, hit him in the face, hit him in the mouth. He's not allowed to say that. He's been brought up on these charges and, and we already are assuming he's guilty, so smack him. Paul was saying, I live my life for the audience of one person. I want the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart to be acceptable in the sight of God. He wants to live to please God. That's all that he said so far, but this idea that Paul could be right in what he was doing and not some sort of criminal, Ananias couldn't stand that. He wanted him punished, and so he says that he needs to be hit. 
Verse 3, Paul responding says, Then Paul said unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for sinnest thou to judge me after the law and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? Paul is bold for sure here, maybe, maybe overly bold, as we'll see him walk back some of what he says. But he says, you're going to hit me? God is going to take care of you. That is, a, that is a scary thing, isn't it? The idea that God will take care of you? God, someone will tell God on you? I don't know that I want to be brought into that hand of deliverance. Here, Ananias said, I'll take care of you, Paul. And Paul said, God will take care of you. And history declares that he was actually hunted down, Ananias was, for the type of person that he was. History says that he had a very pro-Roman position a lot of times, and Jewish nationalists were not happy with him, and he got chased and hunted down and eventually killed by his own people. But he calls him a whited wall. Have you ever been in a building where they painted over something instead of fixing it? The wall was bowed. It was not. I lived in a dorm room like that. I don't know how many coats of wall, uh, paint was on my dorm room walls. They should have long ago done something else, but they just threw another coat of paint on it. Didn't even look like they cleaned it or sanded it before they put paint on it. What were they doing? They were covering it up. And they would whitewash these walls in the Bible lands to try and make them look nice and clean when they really weren't nice and clean and try and make them look new when they weren't new. And what Paul was accusing him of was this hypocrisy that they had been guilty of for a while. Even Jesus said these words. They, he just said that they were like sepulchers. They were like whited tombstones that were really washed clean, but on the inside they were filled with death, with dead men's bones, with rot. And he said here, you, you look like you're one thing on the outside, but we know what you are on the inside. And he says, you're going to try and sit here and judge me for breaking the law, which is what they thought Paul had done. And yet you're going to hit me before I've been declared guilty, because Jewish law and custom is that you're innocent until declared guilty. You're going to hit me as though I'm already guilty. So Paul rebukes him for this. Ananias, he was someone who used intimidation in order to, to lead the people that he was in charge of, which is an awful thing. It's not appropriate that we try and lead through intimidation or through throwing our weight around. That is not what God calls us to do, especially not the leader of God's people. Verse 4, they respond to him and say, they that stood by said, revilest thou God's high priest? How are you speaking such insulting, terrible words to God's high priest? You're not supposed to do that. You're sitting here correcting him when you've done wrong. Verse 5, then said Paul, I wist not, I didn't know, brethren, that he was the high priest. Perhaps he didn't know who it was that had said that he ought to be smit or smitten or smote. Perhaps he didn't realize being away for decades now from the service of this council. By the way, once upon a time, Paul served this council. He went and hunted down Christ, uh, Christians on behalf of this council. And so at one point, he would have been very familiar with who was in charge, and they would have been very familiar with him. But he said, I recognize that I shouldn't speak evil of the ruler of his people. He didn't say he was wrong, though, did he? Paul said, I should not have spoken as I did about the ruler, but not that the ruler was actually a good person. And this brings us back to Exodus chapter 22 in verse number 28. It says, thou shalt not revile the gods nor curse the ruler of thy people. So he recognizes that he ought not to have spoken like this against that man, but he knew that though he could not respect the person, he could respect the position. And I think that there's something to be said for that. We live in a society where leadership and authority are commonly spoken evil against, and what that does is it destroys authority. I knew somebody that every single time that their child got in trouble, every single time their child got in trouble at school or in some sort of extracurricular program, this parent would attack in front of their children and to the face of the principal or the vice principal or of their coach would attack them and say why they were wrong and their kid was right. Every time it happened. They get a call from school, your child is misbehaving, we need you to come, they did this, they hit this kid, they, and she would come in there and she would just blast the principal. She would blast the vice principal. She would blast the coach. And then later on, she wondered, why is it that my son is so rebellious? Why is it that he won't listen to me and he won't listen to anybody else? 
It came from her not realizing that what she was doing was undermining her own authority by tearing down all authority in the life of her child. We can think things about the rulers of our nation. We can even think things about people that God may have put over us for a time, whether it's our bosses or even a pastor, and we may say, I don't like what they're doing. I don't agree with them. And there are steps that we take with certain things. But to speak evil of them is to undermine the whole idea of authority, which is really what God has put into place. That doesn't mean I agree. That doesn't mean I won't respectfully disagree. That doesn't mean I won't call what is evil, evil, and what is good, good. But how we do those things is actually very important. In verse number six, it says, but when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. Paul's hope was that he could preach the gospel to his countrymen and that they would believe the gospel. We know that he had a heart for the Jewish people and greatly desired them to become followers of Jesus and to be saved. He says in the book of Romans, in the 11th chapter, that if he could give his own life and die and go to hell so that his countrymen would be saved, he'd be willing to do that. That's a bold statement. That's a powerful statement. And here he is hoping that they would listen to him, but he can't even get a word out. He says one sentence and it's all about hitting him all of a sudden. He realizes that they're going to make this all about him when his desire is to make this hearing all about Jesus, which is what they need to hear. And so he recognizes, I've got to get this thing back on track because we're getting off into the weeds and I need to get back to talking about the Messiah. And he notices something. He pays attention to who he's talking to. He recognized that there were two different main groups, almost everybody siding with one or the other inside of this council. There were two different groups. One is known as the Pharisees. One is known as the Sadducees. They were the ruling kind of political parties, if you want to think about it. The Pharisees were very strict. They were very big on following the law, just so. In fact, they even came up with some laws of their own, the laws of men, that they would sadly teach as the laws of God, but that they would say, we don't want to cross this line, so let's make another line here, so if we never cross this one, then we'll make sure we never get here. And they were very big on what they ought to do and what they ought not do. And the Sadducees were much more relaxed about those things. They were known more as what we might think of as liberal theologians, not for what party they voted for, but how seriously they took the word of God. And they were very comfortable with saying, well, we know what the scriptures say, but we really don't believe that. We're given a specific thing here. Paul said that he was called into question over the resurrection of the dead. You see, there was in the Jewish teachings, even before we heard about the Lord Jesus, there was this idea that God would raise up at the end of days those the the righteous dead unto reward and the wicked unto punishment. That idea was already in there long before Jesus came. And the Pharisees, they looked at what the Old Testament said, they looked at what Moses said in the law and what the prophets said, and they say, we believe that, and it talks about the resurrection of the dead, and so we believe in that. But the Sadducees, they didn't believe in hardly anything supernatural. They really didn't. It's described for us as we keep reading. It says in verse 7, And when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. Everybody took a side, and it turned into a big old argument. People are yelling at each other. Have you ever watched certain countries overseas, especially in the UK, when their parliament gets together, and they're just yelling at each other? How many of you have ever seen that? right? We tend, as bad as things are here, we don't quite have that yet inside of Congress or or the House of Representatives, right? The Senate or the, but they're yelling. It's what this devolved into. And they start talking because he brought up a sore subject, if you will, this idea on whether or not there really is anything after this life is over. And that's a controversy that we face in our society today. You've got a lot of people that don't want to believe in the supernatural. Verse eight tells us that for the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. The Sadducees don't believe in anything religious, anything spiritual to their religion. Their religion is simply a way that they live and traditions, philosophy 
that they use in order to maintain power, and a lot of the Sadducees got rich off of it. They liked what they got out of it, but they really didn't believe any of it, which is a sad state of affairs that they had so much power in the religious life of God's people when they didn't even believe in God's word. And the other side were Pharisees, and the Pharisees, they had a huge problem with hypocrisy, by the way. They, they, they were not the good guys, but they did at least believe that there was a resurrection and that angels and spirits are real. They did believe those things. Sadducees didn't believe those, but the Pharisees did. Let this remind us that because someone might be correct on one point, it does not necessarily mean that they're correct on every point. We have to still be careful. Because the Pharisees were right about the fact that there is a resurrection of the dead, and that there are angels and spirits, it doesn't mean that everything that the Pharisees taught were right. We've got to exercise discernment and run everything by the Word of God. We have to be careful because we could turn on the radio and hear a preacher on the radio, and we might say, I like what he's saying, that's true, but not everything that he says is true. Or we may read an author and we might say, I love how she wrote this, this is fantastic, but she might not be right in everything. One of the examples that I give to this is I had a young man who was so passionate about missions when I taught in Bible college down in Tennessee. He was so passionate about missions, and he loved this one author's writing about how we do missions for the glory of God. Not for the people, because the people that we go to may not even be happy that we're there, right? They may not even appreciate that we've left home and comfort and our society to come and bring them the gospel at great cost to ourselves. So we can't go for them because they're not always going to be somebody that we love enough, but we do love God and God is worth it and we glorify his name by going. And since he wants them and we love him, we'll go after them on his behalf. And he loved this idea of missions for the glory of God, not for the need of man. And I say amen to that. The problem was this author was wrong in some other areas. How he viewed salvation was off. How he viewed that the Bible was divided up, was off. And so he got so excited about this that he bought 20 books in a case from this author, not realizing that it was against what we even taught at the Bible college, some of this guy's other beliefs. And he started handing them out to everybody because he got so excited about it, because he loved this thing. And he ended up going off into doctrinal error because he found one thing that he loved that this guy was teaching but he didn't have the discernment or the maturity yet to analyze the rest of what he taught. And we ought to be careful. We ought to be slow to make changes. We ought to run things through, well, what does the Bible say? We ought to ask good, trusted sources, whether those are authors, whether those are people that we know, like pastors, Sunday school teachers. We ought to be very careful with what it is. But the Pharisees at least were right on this point. And it says in verse 9, And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. This is so funny. This group was willing to kill Paul when he walked in the room. They were ready to pull him apart in the street and beat him to death as they tried just the day before. They were so ready to do that, but because... All of a sudden, now Paul seems to support their side in this age-old argument on whether or not there's a resurrection. Now they're like, we like him. And they said, we think if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, then that's from God. That's divine revelation. And if we don't go along with that, we might end up fighting against God. If we deny divine revelation, we are fighting against God, and he may have heard from a spirit or an angel, is that what Paul heard from? No, he heard directly from the Lord Jesus Christ. He had an encounter with the risen Christ. Christ revealed truth to him. It was more than that. They didn't totally understand what was going on, but they thought that they had a point in their argument, and they said, we like this guy. You know, we think he's innocent. So now the Pharisees are defending Paul. And at least Paul has them talking about the resurrection and not whether or not they're going to hit him in the mouth. So he's bringing them back to the resurrection, which I applaud Paul for doing because it's so easy to get off topic when you talk with people about the things of God. Have you ever gotten off topic when trying to talk with somebody about Jesus? Your desire was to teach them about the Savior, that our precious Lord who died for us and rose from the grave, and we want them to know the joy we know, and we want them to have the peace that we have, and we want God who has gone to such great lengths to save them. We want, we want them to know him. And you start talking, and man, you get off in the weeds. 
you got to bring that thing back to what really matters, right? I, I don't, I remember I was studying uh, at the University of Tennessee during my seminary time, not that I took seminary classes at the University of Tennessee, but they had a library that was open all night, and they had a coffee shop that was open all night, which sometimes when you're working and have a family, that's the only way you get your homework done, is you got to go down there and do whatever you got to do. And I, I remember I was sitting there, and I had some of my work out, and somebody walked by my little booth that I was at in the all-night coffee shop, and they said, what's soteriology? Just a perfect stranger said, what's soteriology, which was on the front of one of my books, which is the study of salvation, right? And I'm like, well, let me, let me tell you what that is. I thought, what an amazing opportunity. All he wanted to talk about was gay marriage. I kept trying to speak with him about Jesus and about salvation, and all he wanted to do was talk about gay marriage because that's the one thing that he knew about with Christianity and disagreed with, and he kept going back to that, and I kept trying to bring it to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we can get caught all in the weeds, and yes, there are times to answer people's questions, but when we're sharing the good news, we need to tell them what the good news is. Uh, of course, I eventually told him what God's Word says about marriage and divine design and what God has made in man and woman in marriage together, and we talked about that, but he didn't need to be convinced about God's divine design for marriage. This man was lost. He needed to be introduced to the Savior. I, I would have just been hitting my head against the wall trying to get this guy to believe like a Christian and live like a Christian until he becomes a Christian. So he needs the Savior first, right? And so that's what I was trying to get him, uh, and it was, it was hard to bring him back to that topic. And we have here Paul trying to bring them back to this topic. Well, it got wild. Verse 10. And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. Well, that's, those are some vivid words. Pulled in pieces. What do you think they were doing? Right? They had their hands on him. And the, the Pharisees were trying to grab him and take him away from the mob of the Sadducees that wanted to kill him and put him to death. They, they were trying to, to pull him apart. And they said, we've got to put a stop to this. The Roman soldiers did. We can't let this happen. He's a Roman citizen. We can't just let mob justice happen. So they went down there and they, they took him out by brute force, by violence. Because, of course, the Romans are ruling over the Jewish people as the Roman Empire had conquered most of the known world in this region. And so... It's a sort of an odd situation. We're going to hear more about what happened. There's going to be an assassination attempt. There's going to be a, a, a promise that they all make to each other. But before we get to that, let's look at some of the things that this passage calls us to do in application. Real quick before the applications, when people cannot refuse, when people hate the message but they cannot refute it, they will attack the messenger. When people hate the message and they cannot refute it or refuse it, they end up hating the messenger. You know, it's, well, I don't have anything to argue against with them, but I don't like this, so now I will try and attack this person so that I don't have to agree that they're right. And we ought not be surprised if when we share the good news of Jesus Christ and we answer people's questions, that if they are invested in not believing because they don't want to change their life, they don't want to admit that they're wrong, they don't want to do whatever it is that they're convicted about doing, we ought not be surprised when people get mad at us. Uh, I, have, I have had that happen. Uh, I remember sitting with somebody that I invited with me to church when I was down in, in Ohio State, and the pastor was getting up and he was preaching, and he was preaching a message about salvation and sin, and I brought a lost person with me, and they're like, man, who does that guy think he is? Short little Napoleon complex tyrant trying to rule over everybody, and, and, and I'm just like, wow. I didn't pick that up from the message at all. I didn't think he was being a tyrant at all. But they were upset with what they've heard, and they were convicted by it in their own heart, meaning that they felt the guilt of it. So let's draw some points of application. First of all, we should live to please God. We should live to please God. Paul says that I have lived in good conscience before God until this day. Who was it that Paul was trying to please with his life? It was the Lord. You see, when we're pulled in all these different directions, and there's so many people that have so many expectations of us, you and I can feel like we're never winning. We're never winning. We're always behind. I am not this, and I am not that. 
right? I'm not the, the employee I need to be because my boss wants more, and I'm not the, the spouse that I need to be, or I'm not the father or mother that I need to be, or I'm not the, the son or daughter that I need to be, or I'm not the neighbor that I need to be, or the church member, or whatever it is. We can start to feel like there's so much expectation put on us, and how can I be everything to everyone? And as many of you who have tried can attest, you can't be everything to everyone, can you? We can't be. That's a surefire way to make yourself crazy, is to try and please everybody. But there is, and you, you can't please everybody. And, and really, really, there's only one person you can please, and that's the Lord. Can we please ourselves? Can we ever be enough for ourselves? I don't know that there's anybody who's more severe on us than we are on us. You ever felt like you were your own biggest critic? Right? And, and you just keep beating yourself up for all the things that you're not. We can't seem to please ourselves. Even our spouse and our family, as good as it is to try and be what they need, we can never be everything they need because they can only find everything they need in Jesus Christ. And if we try and be that, we're going to make ourselves crazy. But what we find that is if we seek to please God, all these other things fall into place. Look with me in Proverbs. Would you? Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16. In verse number 7. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. That phrase, he maketh even his enemies, it's up to and including even his enemies. When, when we please the Lord, we're going to please those people that are closest to us. Because when I'm seeking to please God, I will be the type of husband that I need to be. And when I seek to please the Lord, I will be the kind of father that I need to be. And when I seek to please the Lord, I will be the kind of pastor that I need to be. And you fill in the blank for whatever you are and the roles that God has given you. I can be the kind of son that I need to be when my ways please the Lord. I can be the kind of citizen. I can be the kind of friend that I need to be when my ways please the Lord. And Paul said that he had, in good conscience, lived in order to please God. To the best of his understanding. Did Paul always do right? No. And he even admitted that, that he did not always do right. But he knew that the one who judged him was God. Paul faced a lot of scrutiny in his ministry. Paul faced a lot of scrutiny. Read 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians is almost entirely Paul defending the fact that he was an apostle of Jesus Christ, that he was called into that ministry. They, the, there were people that were detracting him all the time. They say, look at this guy. He's pathetic looking. You see him, when he, and when he speaks, he's nothing special. Yeah, his writing's pretty good, but this guy, this little imp of a guy, who's he going around telling everybody what they ought to do, right? He's nothing compared to these other people that are all impressive looking. So Paul has faced a lot of scrutiny in his life. He's had a lot of people demand a lot of things out of him. He's been put in a lot of difficult situations. But he has found that when he makes his ways to please the Lord, that even his enemies... That even others, up and including that, this maxim is true. God is the one who blesses and rewards, and being on the Lord's side is always a great place to be. We don't want to try and get God on our side. We want to find out where God's side is, and we want to be there. And so in our words, as the psalmist says, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. We should seek, starting with our own thoughts, and our words, and of course our actions to try and please God. There are some times, there are some times when we are around people who don't really deserve our best behavior because of how they're behaving. We're around people that don't really deserve our best behavior because of how they're behaving. Please don't point at anyone. No elbows, <clears throat> none of that. But there are times. But you know who always deserves our best? Is the Lord Jesus Christ. You know who always meets expectation is the Lord Jesus Christ. So I can be what I'm supposed to be regardless of circumstances around me and who is or is not pulling their weight and who is behaving and not behaving. I can do what is right because I'm seeking to please the Lord 
And that's not dependent on the circumstances. So if I'm with somebody in business and they're awful and I hate working for this boss, I can still seek to please the Lord and let my ways please the Lord because it doesn't have to do with him. It has to do with the Lord. And you may be at home in a situation where your spouse or your parent or your children are not acting in the way that they ought to be acting. You can still make your ways seek to please the Lord and be the kind of person that we ought to be regardless of whether or not the people around us deserve it because it's about Jesus and not about them. Their bad behavior does not excuse our bad behavior, right? Because our audience that we're living for is that audience of one. It's always the Lord himself. So let's live to please God. Secondly, let's declare the resurrection of Christ. Paul makes sure to redirect the conversation to Christ's resurrection. The resurrection is very important. I don't think we can overstate how important it is. We really don't have any reason to be here tonight unless there was a resurrection. Unless Jesus Christ bodily died and bodily rose from the dead, we really don't have anything to be here about tonight. But because Jesus Christ died and because he bodily rose from the dead, we have a great reason to be here. You see, it's, it's a, a habit that some of us have gotten into. We talk about how Christ has died, and whether this is preaching or teaching or sharing our faith, we talk about how Christ has died for our sins, but the good news is more than him dying. The good news is him rising from the dead. If he didn't rise again, as he said he would, then Jesus did not fulfill his word. Jesus is not the Son of God. He does not have power over death, hell, and the grave. He did not conquer them. We can't say, O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? We can't say that because death still rules over us. But if Jesus rose again and he is alive forevermore, then because he lives, you and I shall live too since we put our faith and trust in him. The whole reason that his disciples continued on after his public death in a most gory and shameful way, is because they saw the resurrected Lord. There's no other way to explain why they would be willing to do what they did if Jesus did not rise again. There's lots of evidence and reasoning behind the resurrection, but when you and I talk of the death of Christ, let's also talk of his resurrection, because that's the good stuff. There was a movie that came out a number of decades ago called The Passion of Christ. Any of you see it? Right? Kind of gory, right? not for everybody, but it made me angry. It made me angry because they built up this whole thing of what happened to Jesus through his suffering. And you get less than three seconds of him risen from the grave at the very end. You get like a bright light and a flash and some kind. I'm like, no, that's the good stuff. That's the receipt on the transaction of our salvation. That's the paid in full is him rising from the grave. That's, that's the part we want. And so let us not make small of that. Let us make much of that. It proves he's the Messiah. It proves he's the Savior and that our sins have been forgiven. I have a friend who pastors in the city of Oxford in England. Oxford, the city of Oxford, is known for the College of Oxford, which is thought of as one of those great institutions of learning, Cambridge and Stanford and MIT. These are well-known places. And he went there to plant a church and revitalize a Baptist chapel that had gone under and was then empty. And his pastor of his sending church told him, when you get there and you get invited to speak at these different events, which undoubtedly you will, at the college, he says, I don't want you to get into the weeds of what's called apologetics. Apologetics is this practice of the defense of the faith. Right? Here's all of the evidence of why what we believe is true, and here's all of the, the reasoning and the classical arguments for why these things are true. He says, when you get an opportunity to speak, I want you to preach the gospel. He's like, that's what I want you to do. They're going to try and lure you into arguing about the age of the earth. They're going to try and get you into arguing about scribal errors and the manuscript tra uh, tradition. He's like, I want you to leave all of that stuff, and I want you to preach Jesus crucified and risen again. And did you know people had to stand outside Oxford Baptist Chapel to hear in through the windows the preaching that was going on. It was wild to see what God did inside of that city. And he did get a chance to speak in the lecture halls in Oxford. And do you know what he did? He preached the gospel instead of getting out into the weeds. I think it's a great encouragement to know that that is what saves people. It is the gospel that saves. Apologetics can be helpful. It can help us as Christians understand that our faith has a reason behind it. It is not unreasonable, but it is based on many things.
but it is the gospel, the declaration of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. That's where faith comes from. You cannot argue somebody into faith in Christ. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so we preach the good news. Lastly, let's be careful not to fight against God. The Pharisees warned that if we ignore divine revelation, they thought it might be from an angel or a spirit, if we ignore these divine words from God, then we end up fighting against God. What he was saying is, if Paul really did see something, if he really did experience something, if he really did have some, some sort of issue, and they didn't even understand what they were saying at this moment, and we go against it, then we're going against God. You and I can take this idea... And we can say that the Pharisees, though they were wrong in what they understood about Paul, they were right in this idea that if God speaks on a topic and we go against it, it is the equivalent of fighting against God. That doesn't seem to be a great idea. Fighting against God seems like to be a very bad idea. Not because he's just going to knock us over the head like some kind of cosmic bully. No one loves us more than God loves us. And no one has given more for us than God has given for us. And no one is more committed and more faithful to us than God is. So we know that God seeks to bless us. But as God's people, I'm not surprised when people that don't know Christ refuse God's word and fight against it. But today, Christians end up fighting against God when they refuse to obey the Bible, which is divine revelation. When we read something that we don't like, that requires us to change, that requires us to repent, that requires us to deal with something differently in our lives, whether that has to do with spiritual things, and everything is really connected spiritually, but it might be how we conduct our relationships, it might be how we behave ourselves in the home, it might have to do with how we spend our money, it might have to do with how we spend our time, it might have to do with what goes on in our thought life and what we do on our phones and what we do after we think everybody's gone to bed. We have these moments when the Spirit of God convicts us by the Word of God, and when we say, no, not today, not yet, it's not that big of a, it's not that much of a problem, I'm working on it. When we refuse to do that, this phrase of fighting against God really describes where we're at. We're in a place of open rebellion. God has made everything. There's no one as powerful and wise and loving as he is. And so he really is in charge. And if God is calling us to change and we refuse, that is fighting against God. There's a hymn that came to mind as I was studying this passage. It is hymn 363 in your hymnal. I think I also put the words up inside of the slides here. Is that in there? His way with thee? It says, Would you live for Jesus and be always pure and good? Would you walk with him within the narrow road? Would you have him bear your burden, carry all your load, let him have his way with thee? Would you have him make you free and follow at his call? Would you know the peace that comes by giving all? Would you have him save you so that you need never fall, let him have his way with thee? Would you in his kingdom find a place of constant rest? Would you prove him true in providential test? Would you in his service labor always at your best? Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul, and you will see it was best for him to have his way with thee. When we fight against God, we really fight against ourselves. We are taking the one who wants the best for us, and therefore we're fighting against the best for us, and we are the ones who miss out in the end. A few questions as we make our way towards prayer time. Who or what do people live for instead of living to please God? Who or what do people live for instead of living to please God? What are some of the bad substitutes that we find out there? Jim? Money. Money. Poor substitute. What else? Just yeah, just ourself. Whatever feels good to us, whatever seems good. Yeah, Joan? Position or status. Position or status. We want people to have that affirmation and like us. What else? What else are people living for? Pleasure. Pleasure. 
Power? Yeah. And, and they all seem pretty good at the start, but how much power? How much is enough? Can we ever really please ourselves? Aren't we sort of fickle where we kind of bounce around, I want this, no, then I want that. No, I get what I think I want, and then I don't really want that, so now I want something else. It's a miserable way to live. We think we know what the answer is, but then we get it, and we're like, ugh. It's like a dog chasing a car. If he caught it, he wouldn't know what to do with it, right? And so why is it hard to live to please God? Why is that hard? It seems so obvious, and why doesn't everybody do it? Ben? Oh, it went. Well, when it comes back, let me know. Why is it hard, Jim? Yeah, you have to deny yourself to do that. Joan? Yeah, our feelings, easier to live by those. Ron, did you have your hand up? Yes, we don't know what God wants of us. What's that? You found it? Let him have his way. Let him have his way with thee, yep. People don't wonder what that is. They don't want to have his way. You know what's wild? You remember hearing people say, oh, if I surrender to the Lord, he's going to call me to be a missionary in Siberia. <laughs> right? I know it's going to be bad. Right? Is that really what you think of God? Is he that kind of bully that just wants you to be unhappy? Really? And if he did want you to go to Siberia, you would love it. Because that's the center of God's will for your life. So I remember thinking dumb thoughts like that and, and thinking that God was out to get me to try and make me miserable or uncomfortable. And that's what it was like to, to be surrendered to God. Praise God that that's not who he is and that's not how that works. How, what can we do to keep ourselves from fighting against God? What can we do to keep ourselves from there? Yep, yeah, Chris? Surrender. Surrender. Ooh, what a nasty word. It's a good one, though, isn't it? Harold? Be in his word. Be in his word. Yes. Read the Bible. What else can we do to keep us so we're not fighting against the Lord? Walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. That is the shortcut to pleasing the Lord. Because when you and I walk in the Spirit, and the Spirit of God, whatever He wants us to, to do whatever he wants us to say, whatever he wants us to think, we're always going to end up in the right spot. Instead of trying to remember like a list, it's the difference between someone giving you turn-by-turn -turn directions and you following someone to where you need to go. If you just follow where you need to go, you're going to get there, and you don't have to worry that you're going to make a wrong turn. That's great. What else? Yeah, Jory? Yeah, practicing discernment. What, what does God say? Is this the right thing? You know, because we don't want to find ourselves in the wrong place. Liam? Um, prayer. prayer, for sure. Absolutely. Pray that God shows us. Pray that he shows us in areas where we might be not doing what he wants us to do, because sometimes we don't even know what's going on in our own heart. Yeah, those are great answers. And Paul earnestly, beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for Paul's desire to live for you, to live to, for your pleasure, and may we take that as our, our call. What is it that you would have us to say, to think? What would you have us to do? What should our motivations be? What should we be dwelling on? And may we do those things. Guide us by thy spirit. Help us to walk in thy spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.